The 10th of May was an important date for Frenchmen in 1802. That day, a plebiscite, a kind of referendum or election, was held across France. On the ballot was the simple question as to whether or not Napoleon Bonaparte, who just a few years earlier had been proclaimed as First Consul of France, should be granted that office for life. Over 99.7% of people voted yes, that they wanted Napoleon to become the French head of state for as long as he lived or decided to hold the office. Though some electoral fraud was doubtlessly a factor in this landslide victory, there is no doubting that Bonaparte would have won a clear victory in this plebiscite with or without vote rigging. Such was his popularity across France in the summer of 1802. Three months later, on the 2nd of August 1802, the result of the plebiscite was made known publicly, and Napoleon Bonaparte was formally declared to be First Consul of France for life. Napoleon never struck one as a warrior. His height was average for the time, his frame thin, and his complexion bordering on delicate. His hair was shorter cropped now than it had been for anyone who had known him a decade earlier on Corsica or at Toulon in the early years of the revolution. It has been widely speculated that Napoleon's decision to make himself Emperor of France was taken in response to the assassination attempts and conspiracies which seemed to constantly swirl around him in the early 1800s. Certainly, this was the drift of a message which the French Senate sent him days after the uncovering of the plot in which it was stated that new constitutional innovations might be necessary to preserve Napoleon's position and the advance of the revolution. For his part, Napoleon stated on the 28th of March that he did not require any further titles or promotions, but this was a false modesty, which he did not really possess. In reality, Napoleon had been adopting more and more of the trappings of royalty and imperium ever since his confirmation as First Consul for Life in 1802, and was on record as stating that the establishment of a hereditary monarchy might be the best preventative measure against a counter-revolution and the restoration of the Bourbon monarchy. This was an interesting slight of intellectual argument. Napoleon was suggesting that the surest way of preventing the restoration of the old monarchy was to establish a Bonapartist monarchy. As contradictory as his argument might have been, many people agreed. Napoleon's coronation took place at the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris on the 2nd of December, 1804. It was one of the most formidable acts of political propaganda in modern history. In many ways, it was modeled on the coronation of Charlemagne, the founder of the Carolingian Empire, a millennium earlier in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome on Christmas Day 800. Napoleon would seek to mimic this and requested Pope Pius VII to attend the coronation and bestow him with his new titles. On the morning of the ceremony itself, Napoleon set out with his wife Josephine from the Tuileries Palace towards Notre Dame. At the cathedral, he was vested with a lengthy satin white tunic and a mantle of crimson, velvet and ermine. Thereafter, Pius crowned Bonaparte with the words, May the Emperor live forever, which Napoleon responded with a vow to preserve the Republic, which had just been cast aside in order to crown him as Emperor. The whole coronation ceremony was a fitting effort to emphasize parallels between Napoleon and Charlemagne. After all, the Frankish king had conquered much of Western and Central Europe, and as time would prove, Bonaparte was determined to do the same and more. Both after his coronation and before it, Napoleon oversaw a series of wide-ranging domestic reforms of French society. One of the most pressing issues for Napoleon to confront in terms of social, economic and political policy in the early 1800s was the position of the Roman Catholic Church in France. The revolutionaries had been extremely opposed to the influence which the Church held across French society and had accordingly stripped the church of vast amounts of its wealth and power. Yet, for all that, 
The leaders of the revolution in Paris had been determined to engineer a new atheistic man of reason. A great many Frenchmen and women were still very much Roman Catholics, and the anti-Catholic measures promulgated in the 1790s left them disaffected. It was for this reason that Napoleon, who had largely abandoned any form of religious belief himself in his younger years, determined to reconcile with the papacy and the church in the early 1800s. The result, after much negotiation, was the Concordat of 1801, agreed between Bonaparte and Pope Pius VII in July of that year. With the enshrinement of the Concordat, upwards of 10,000 priests and clerics who had been in exile since the 1790s were able to return home to France. Churches across the country were reopened and the church was allowed to oversee much of the primary education school system across France yet again. The Corsican should also be commended for reopening the Sorbonne, or University of Paris in 1808, which had been closed by the revolutionaries, as well as on his plans to establish an imperial college system which would oversee national education. But in other areas, he was utterly backwards. Napoleon restored the management and implementation of primary school education into the hands of the Roman Catholic Church, a retrograde measure at the start of the century which would witness Europe trying at length to separate the ties between the church and education in many countries. While his views on girls being formally educated can only be described as incredibly backwards, the emperor stating at one time that the role of women was family life and the home. The French Revolution had been initiated and driven with the idea of dispensing of the old order, with its aristocratic titles inherited from the medieval period and the trappings of nobility. Accordingly, the aristocracy had been dismantled in the 1790s. But just as he was preparing to be crowned as Emperor of the French, Bonaparte also began creating a new nobility. As with medieval kings and queens, dispensing titles like baron and earl on their closest supporters, Napoleon was effectively using the creation of a new aristocracy as a means of dispensing patronage to his allies and family members. Consequently, some of his most senior marshals and generals would be rewarded with titles, while after a certain point, it became standard to award government ministers, ambassadors, and other senior officials with titles like Baron and Count. The resumption of hostilities with Britain was absolutely critical for the development of a new coalition against the French in the mid-1800s. From when it first went to war with revolutionary France in 1793 until the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, Britain bankrolled Europe's wars against the French. Britain might have been a small nation, with a population only half the size of France's, but it was the wealthiest nation on earth in per capita terms. With this wealth, Britain was able to finance the maintenance of a strong royal navy throughout the wars, efforts which robbed France of the ability to dominate the seas as well as the land. While Britain and France were at war from the summer of 1803, the wider war of the Third Coalition took until 1805 to fully erupt. Already in 1804, the British government was actively looking for allies. It found one in the shape of Sweden, a power which had been relatively unopposed to France in previous years, but which had broken off diplomatic contacts with Paris following the arrest and execution of the Duc d'Anguillon in the spring of 1804. Sweden subsequently allowed Britain to begin amassing its troops in Pomerania, in what is now northern Germany. Eventually, in the summer of 1805, the Russians decided to enter the war on Britain and Sweden's side. With this, France's former enemies were emboldened. The Austrians, who had begun to modernize and reform their army after the humiliations of the Italian campaign of 1796 and 1797, and the Battle of Marengo in 1800, rolled the dice and declared war on Napoleon in August 1805, followed by the Kingdom of Naples, the last major independent power in Italy in September.
A key element of the new war was Napoleon's determination to finally defeat the perennial enemy which he had failed to do so far, Britain. Plans had been drawn up by the revolutionary government in Paris as early as the mid-1790s to invade Britain, with many such designs hinging on the idea of invading Ireland first and using it as a staging site for a conquest of Britain. But these had all come to naught. When hostilities recommenced in 1803, Bonaparte became determined to finally launch a direct invasion of England. All of this was reliant on France's naval forces being gathered together and deployed to control the English Channel. No successful landing in southern England could be achieved without this provision, and even as the plans for the land army were advanced into early 1805, much of the French fleet was still in the Mediterranean, a long way away from where it needed to be to effect any invasion. Bonaparte's efforts to bring the French Mediterranean fleet into the Atlantic with the Spanish fleet and head for the English Channel would lead to one of the most famous naval battles in history. The Battle of Trafalgar was one of the greatest naval victories ever won. Nelson turned prevailing naval tactical wisdom on its head, which said that ships should line up alongside each other and simply try to outgun the enemy. Instead, he decided to sail his ships directly at the Franco-Spanish lines. Using this method, he broke their fleet into three isolated contingents. By the end of the day, 21 of the 33 Franco-Spanish ships had been captured, including Villeneuve and his flagship. Though victory at the Battle of Trafalgar came at a heavy price for Nelson, who was shot by a musket ball and killed shortly before the fighting ended, the British didn't lose a single ship. Napoleon's plans for an invasion of Britain were in ruins. French defeat at Trafalgar and the collapse of the British invasion plans were more than compensated for by the victories Napoleon was winning in Central Europe against the other members of the Third Coalition. Following the declaration of war on France by Austria in August 1805, Napoleon quickly began preparing La Grande Armée to campaign eastwards into Germany. What has become known as the Ulm Campaign would be one of the most striking accomplishments in military history. The campaign was based on a new approach by Napoleon. While Napoleon had a massive numerical advantage when he entered Germany in mid-autumn, this would only last a limited period of time before the Russians arrived to reinforce the Austrian positions. Napoleon engaged in days of rapid forced marches, bringing some of his troops through neutral Prussian territory in order to bring much of his forces around to the rear of the Austrian position. Days of maneuvers followed, as the French and Austrians tried to establish the best possible position for their attack. These culminated in mid-October with the Battle of Ulm, a four-day conflict which ranged around the wider Ulm area in southern Germany. By the time it was done, several thousand Austrian troops were killed or wounded. With this, the Austrian front in Germany collapsed, and the way was clear for Napoleon to strike directly into Austrian territory. While the Ulm campaign was proceeding in Germany, there was a second major front being fought on in Italy, particularly after the Kingdom of Naples joined the Third Coalition in September 1805, a few weeks after Austria declared war on France. To the north in Germany, after losing Vienna to the French, the Austrians under Francis II had realized that they could not engage with Napoleon's forces again until such time as they were reinforced by Tsar Alexander I and his Russian forces. In the meantime, Francis held out the possibility of peace negotiations and an armistice to try to limit Bonaparte's movements. But by late November, it was clear that the Austrians and Russians were intent on continuing the fight in Central Europe, and Napoleon began moving northeast to engage them in Bohemia. Here, he neared the combined Austrian and Russian armies a few kilometers from the city of Bruno, in a place called Austerlitz. The Battle of Austerlitz, which occurred on the 2nd of December 1805, and which is often termed the Battle of the Three Emperors owing to the presence of Napoleon, Francis II and Alexander I on the field of battle, was arguably 
the most significant of Bonaparte's military victories. By the time night descended in the evening, the Austrians and Russians had suffered over 15,000 men killed or wounded, with upwards of 20,000 more captured in the rout at the end of the battle. The French had lost a cumulative number of about 9,000 men killed, wounded and captured. While Russia was merely chastened by this defeat, as Francis II abandoned the field of Austerlitz, he must have known that Austrian involvement in the War of the Third Coalition was over. With victory at Austerlitz and with Vienna occupied by the French, Napoleon was in a position to impose punishing peace terms on Austria for the third time in less than a decade. A ceasefire was agreed in the days after the Battle of Austerlitz and the Treaty of Pressburg was quickly agreed and signed on the 26th of December, 1805. It was a humiliation for Francis II. The government was forced to relinquish Venice and much of what is now Croatia in Dalmatia and Istria. With victory at Austerlitz and the Treaty of Pressburg, the War of the Third Coalition was effectively at an end, with France yet again having emerged victorious from it. Britain, Prussia and Russia now remained the only credible threats to French hegemony in Europe. But there is no doubting Napoleon's ascendancy as the master of Europe at this juncture. He was Emperor of France and King of Italy, with the Low Countries and Western Germany also effectively under French rule. Moreover, numerous second-tier powers had begun to reconcile themselves to French dominance of the continent, notably Spain in the Mediterranean, which was a confirmed ally of France's from the mid-1790s onwards, and Bavaria and Baden in Central Europe. Incredibly, there was more to come, and by the end of the first decade of the 1800s, French power would extend from Lisbon in the west to Warsaw in the east. But this success would bring with it overextension, arrogance, and an excess of nepotism, which would begin to prove to be Napoleon's undoing from 1806 onwards. <laughs>